Ponzi, uh, especially those who were promoted recently uh, to, to a chair. So today we have two outstanding colleagues delivering their inaugural lectures. Um, no, I, I want uh, closely with both of them at, at various uh, stages. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit about Kelly today uh, uh, before I pass the floor to Kelly to deliver the lecture. <laughs> Kelly is a professor of physical activity and health specializing in assessing and promoting physical activity across the health spectrum and life span with a particular focus on children and adolescents. Kelly's work has been ranked in the top 1% in the field, leading to international recognition, which is very important for us. In 2019, Kelly was on the Chief Medical Officer's Expert Working Group for updating the children and young people's UK physical activity guidelines, as well as Chief Medical Officer's Expert Committee for Physical Activity Surveillance. Most recently, Kelly helped establish the now and now co-chairs the Welsh Institute of Physical Activity, Health and Sport in partnership with Sports Wales and higher education institutes across Wales. Kelly leads exercise, medicine and health research group at he is a member of World Health Organization's Health Enhancing Physical Activity Strategic Management Board. Now, as I said, Kelly is, is fantastic. She has been working with me now more than five years uh, in some of the roles. Uh, we work very closely. She, currently, she leads the a research staff working group for the faculty. She not only reports to me, also she reports to the university. And this is going on for a long time. And it, Kelly has done an outstanding job. That's my personal tribute. And with that, I now welcome you, Deliver. Thank you very much. And apologies in advance if I have a coughing fit um, part way through this. Um, when I was starting to plan this talk today, I, um, as a triple academic, started researching and thinking of what is it that I need to put in here and how much content of research versus the personal story should I have. And then I realized that actually at no point in my career have I ever followed key guidelines and therefore decided just to put together what I thought uh, was the best to give a, a good flavor in terms of what I do. And I reflected on some of the nicest talks that I've had and real memorable ones across time. And these were from Professor Rory Wilson, uh, who was one of the first talks that I went to as a uh, British science cafe. And he had me from the first words to the last. It didn't matter that it wasn't my research area. I still remember now about how to measure penguins excreting. <laughs> and the other person was Professor Neil Armstrong, who over in a workshop in Qatar, spoke about his journey through his career. And both of them used stories, so I'm going to hopefully try and embed some of that and do them both a little bit of justice today. So that brings me on to my journey. So usually people have an end point, a destination that they want to go to. Yes, there might be a little few curves in the way, but for me, actually, there was multiple things that I wanted to do. And then there was, within those, there were also quite a few detours as well. So I think it's probably fair to say that my journey's probably been a little bit more like the London tube map. But if you're creative in that and you really think about it, actually each one of these journeys creates part of a picture. And if you put it together, you get a nicer, wider picture. Unfortunately today, I can probably only talk about one of these. Um, so apologies to anyone who's missed off and the wider work that I do be outside the remit of technology. So the first question I will ask you today is, are you sitting comfortably? Are we ready to embark upon this journey? Well, the question really is, should you be? If we come back to sedentary behavior, which is essentially sitting down or lying down with very minimal energy expenditure, that, coupled with being physically inactive, is absolutely detrimental to overall health. We're looking at anything from physiological to psychological health here. It can reduce things like depression by 30%. It has very much um, impacts on various different types of cancer. 
so for this reason, we obviously have to have some form of physical activity guidelines. And I was very delighted to be involved as part of the expert working group as the, the last update in 2019 on this. And essentially, for those of you who don't know, children should be active for at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. That essentially means that you're increasing your heart rate a little bit, but you're still able to engage in conversation. And for adults, we're talking about only 150 minutes of moderate intensity across the week, or even less, 75 minutes of vigorous intensity. Part of my journey in this, and I've, I've, I've got to say thank you to a few key, po key people, is Professor Charlie Foster, who led that physical activity update. Um, thank you for taking a punt on me if you're watching online, Charlie. Um, but also Professor Rashiego, who led um, the expert working group for children and young people. And beyond that, I've also got a big thank you for um, Professor Lynette Mutri, um, as well as Professor Marie Murphy, who uh, we spent pretty much every Friday night during lockdown um, together online discussing what the best strategies were to get people to be as physically active as possible and having a, a representative for each of our home four nations. I'm also very grateful for Marie's leadership um, as part of the World Health Organization's Health Enhancing Physical Activity Group as the current president. So despite all this background in terms of these benefits that we surely all know, the majority of our population are inactive. If we give one example of the biggest problems, and excuse the pun, we would probably think about obesity. So just some data from the US. We've got on the left-hand side overall obesity, so a BMI greater than 30, or severe obesity uh, greater than or equal to 35 for a BMI. If we look, the lowest prevalence is, is the green, all the way through to 60%, which is that purple shade. And we progress through the decades, through to 2020, and then on to the projected figures in terms of 2030. And unfortunately, these stark figures are the same in the UK. We are following the same pathway. But that's a simple solution, right? Move more, sit less, for those who are able to. But despite that, we can't get people. We've got these incredible statistics, statistics that you would think would make people scared sitless. But yet, our environment's very much promoting it. We've come from the hunter-gatherer days where we're really active and hunting for our nutritious food all the way across the years where now we can sit in our cars, very minimal energy expenditure, go to drive throughs get the unhealthiest of food, and what do you know? Oh, we used to have to reach out and type in our pin code. Don't worry, we have long poles and contactless payment now. So we've got to think about the environment. We go back a few decades, we had really big TVs, they were black and white. We were a lot thinner. Now we've gone through the years where now we've got ultra thin LCD TVs, but we're a lot bigger. So we've got to think about technology. Sometimes we go and watch these TVs and we watch people on TV watching TV because that's just what we do. So that then asks, is technology our friend or is it our foe? And my real interest in this actually stems back to my undergraduate degree. So I embarked at the University of Bath to do a maths degree. And I was very fortunate enough to have one of the first people I met in my halls of residence, Laura Harrington. Uh, unfortunately, she's no longer with us, nor is my screen. <laughs> um, but she came to me um, and she suggested that actually perhaps I wasn't particularly happy with it. And she really questioned and said, you know, why is it, why are you particularly doing, sorry, set this up. Why is it that you are doing a math degree? Whenever you talk about sport and exercise sciences that other people are doing, you're passionate about it. And with that, she put me in touch with the right people. Um, there we go. Guessing we've got a dodgy connection here. I'm claiming this time back, by the way. Okay, and with that, she put me in touch with the right people. And these key people across the journey probably have no idea how influential they were. So I then had to report to Professor Alan Batterham, who 
many years later I worked with on the, the physical activity guidelines update. I have never been so scared in my life to walk into his office and he was very unanimous that there was no way I could transfer to that degree at that year, but you have 24 hours to write a personal statement and I'll see if we accept you next year. So thank you very much, luckily that was successful. You would think that the logical thing from maths to sport and exercise sciences would be biomechanics. Well, that's changed with one key lecturer for me, someone who was fantastically passionate about the psychology of physical activity and health. And that was Sean Cumming, who again, I'm very grateful still to collaborate with on, on various things. So thank you very much, Sean. I very much remember various stories about you and your brother learning how to run, and another key example of someone hopefully explaining things through stories. And finally was Martin Standage. So I went to see Martin in my final year to say, I've got a fantastic idea. The Wii has just come out, and I want to know how much energy you actually expend playing it. And he sent me away saying, sorry, that's not in the list. You have to choose a dissertation that's on this pre-selected list. Luckily for me, that evening I had an email to say, actually, I've been talking to a colleague about this, and that's really interesting, come back and talk to us. But the really frustrating thing was, just as we're halfway through this project, this paper got published in the British Medical Journal. <laughs> now you may recognize some people there, a Gareth Stratton and a Nicola Ridges. Little did I know that a few years later, they would be part of my supervisory team for my PhD. Um, so that's obviously threw everything out the water, but many years later we did go back and actually publish this data. And if I'd had my ref hat on and understood that many years ago, there was actually a very novel study at the time um, if we hadn't waited several years to publish it. So this journey continued um, in Loughborough when I was doing my master's and I approached Stuart Biddle to do uh, my dissertation with him. His first question was, well, I'm happy to, but why aren't you doing an MSc in physical activity and health? Why are you doing sports sciences? Honestly, I get my best marks in biomechanics, so strategically, I've picked sports sciences to, to pick that up. But he did allow us to go on and investigate the psychosocial parameters of, it, of active video gaming. And Stuart also introduced me to cluster analyses, which many years later, at Swansea was one of the first things that the computer scientists really pu uh, pushed, so it was nice to have a little step in several years ahead. Um, but Stuart's also got another key um, aspect in my career. At the time, and um, Stuart in the audience, you probably don't know this, but I was debating the PhD or a job offer that paid far more than I was on for several years after my PhD. And I asked Stuart some advice on it, and I thought the sensible thing to do is take the job, get the mortgage like you're meant to do, and then go back and do the PhD you want to do. He just simply said, and again, he doesn't remember this conversation, but how do you know that PhD will be there when the time point you want to do it, you've got to grab it. So thank you very much. So that meant, unfortunately, uh, Stuart Fairclough had to um, take me on as his PhD student. Um, I was very lucky with my wider supervisory team, um, but also uh, to Genevieve Stone and Rebecca Dagger, who um, we had the three of us who worked in partnership on a curriculum-based intervention. Clearly doesn't like my slides. Um, so, Stuart, thank you very much. Um, firstly, for taking a punt on me. Secondly, pushing me when I needed pushing, but probably most importantly, reeling me back in when I probably took on too much at various time points. And then for your continued mentorship across the years. Now, I haven't got too much time to talk about uh, my PhD, but this was, a, there's a lot that can be taken from it just because of the avenues that the, you then go into. I will point out that we did design a curriculum-based intervention, and that 305-page booklet took much longer to write than the actual PhD itself. Um, so, many lessons to be learned there. One thing that I do reflect on was Bear in mind, we're coming from a maths background, was this concept of qualitative research, an idea of using words for research. But it's probably one of the most impactful things that I've actually had. And I never forget the first focus groups that I've run with children, sat on the floor discussing various concepts with them. And I felt totally out of my depth, to the point that it was a case of letting them speak. But then in time, thinking about, okay, what is it that we really need 
uh, to do and how do you reel them back in to on topic because kids are all over the place. And one of them started talking about having two heads and four arms. And I thought, oh no, how do I bring this one back in? And I didn't think fast enough. But then they went on to talk about how important it was because they could watch TV, play their video games at the same time, and eat their burger and chips. And I thought, okay, that's actually really insightful. So hopefully, I've then taken that forward and applied it in a lot more of my research going forward. I was very fortunate two years into my PhD to attend an international conference called PWP. At that conference, I met someone called Professor Karen Pfeiffer. Um, she has now a fantastic colleague, a fantastic mentor, um, but also a fantastic friend. Um, but we also had various fun surfing. Uh, Gareth, you can take the PE teacher out of you, but unfortunately there you are teaching us how to surf. Um, it clearly went very well because I've not been out very much. So at that point, I remember managing to stand up and ride my first wade in when Gareth shouted out, Macintosh! And then it was followed by, I need a word with you. And I thought, uh-oh. PWP went. I still hadn't had a conversation with Gareth. It was a week later. And I don't know if you remember, but I sent an email to say, oh, Gareth, um, you said at PWP you wanted a word with me. And in typical Gareth style, he replied to say, yes, but PWP's been and gone. And I thought, that doesn't tell me. Uh, thankfully, Gareth then picked up the phone and had a conversation and explained that he was coming down uh, to Swansea and there may be an opportunities available. So quickly write up your PhD and then hopefully you can come to Swansea. Uh, there was a year left to go on my PhD, um, but then very, very lucky for me, six months later, um, I was able to, to come to Swansea. What I didn't realize was that 10 years later from that point, would I be co-hosting the international conference in theory here at Swansea, but ended up online uh, with uh, Professor Melita McNary and also Gareth. And then again this year in person. Um, so anyone watching online, please do register. Now the first project that I worked on was really came back home to this, this avenue of technology. And it was bridging the gaps. And the idea here was to have lots of conversations with engineers and computer sciences and really think about how we can link the sport and exercise sciences. And part of the budget actually bought an ex, uh, a Microsoft Connect. But that got me thinking, should we really be using the Connect in the same way that we previously have with active video gaming and using it as an intervention tool? Or should we be using it as a measurement tool? This brings me back to some of my PhD research. Um, so for those of you who are unaware, accelerometers basically measuring how much you move. But what we need to do is translate that into how many minutes you spend in moderate to vigorous physical activity. So essentially, we develop what we call cut point. So if you look at the green line here, anything above that would be classified as active. That would create the 64 minutes. So using that cut point, that person or that child would be classified as active. But if we apply a different cut point, and there are hundreds out there, you get less minutes above it, and therefore you would simply have your participant as inactive. So if you're changing your cut points, you can make your population inactive or, in or active. Now, I don't forget paper rejections, but the first one was from MSSE, and it came back for this paper. Thank you, PLOS One, for accepting it the second time round. Um, but it came back and said, the field's moving on. We're looking at machine learning. So clearly that was then the first thing that I wanted to follow up on coming here. Now if you look here, what we can actually do is think about, okay, well if we've got mu multiple positions of accelerometers, we want to see what someone's doing, but also how much energy they're expending. So we look at kind of pattern analysis, so if you get this particular pattern, you know someone's in this particular um, position, but also how much energy they're expending. Now, we were probably realistically a little bit ambitious on this because over 10 years later, we still haven't really addressed what we set out to do in that project because the area is absolutely vast. But we did meet some fantastic colleagues that we've um, managed to start various different angles within this particular research area. One thing that did come out of this was a link through uh, Rory Wilson's team at the time with Dr. Mark Colton and he created what was called a tag. Now apparently we can't really call that with 
um, tagging children. So we have various different names from it, but one of them is the SLAM tracker. But essentially, this measures at 800 time points a second. But it also looks at the magnetometry data, and that essentially tells you about a change in direction. So there's a lot more things we can look at in this. And one of these earlier things was actually a conversation with Rory Wilson. And he came into the meetings, and I must admit, I love his out of offices, and I love any conversations with him. And he said, cheetahs slow down when they catch prey. Why? And I thought, uh, I, I don't know. OK, well, let's think about this. They're terrestrial animals. They can change their speed, and they can change their direction. So the outcome, in terms of a chase, is quite simple. You have a cheetah. You have a prey, which is a mouse in a very clearly likely scenario. You can, the cheetah can maybe not catch the prey, and then the mouse is a little shaken, but ultimately it's a happy mouse. Or it can be game over. I mean, the cheetah's hungry, but that's totally ruined the mouse's day. But when we think about how do we actually model this, what's actually going on? Well, some of the papers show, if we look here, that this is essentially what we call the vector mag magnitude of EDBA. That's looking at all three planes of an accelerometer and seeing how much it's a proxy for power, essentially. And here you've got large error bars, which means that they're losing a lot of power. So what you're seeing here is the last 15 seconds of a chase. So a chase on average would be 25 to 50 seconds. After 50 seconds, the cheetah's totally cooked. So if you survive 50 seconds, you're good for a couple of seconds anyway. So time point zero here is when they've caught the prey. Irrespective of what pathway is taken here, they always slow down before catching that prey. So what have you learned? Well, firstly, without going into too much detail, if you're chased by a cheetah, what do you do? You run. You bloody run. Which way do you run? Away. But you wait until that cheetah is almost on the back of your neck and you feel the breath and you change direction. If you change direction too quickly, it just looks and thinks, bloody idiot, it's gone that way. Off it goes. But if you wait till that ra last time point, it costs it far more energy to change direction. So hopefully I may have saved a life today. Or probably more realistically, we had a different pathway in terms of research. It made us think about what is the energetic costs of turning in humans. So this was some of the earlier work we did and clearly very exciting for our participants. We looked at measuring four different walking paces and four different angles. And what we've done here is to really think about what's the energetic cost of turning. So if you look at this data, the top one are the, the three accelerometer traces, but the middle one's the magnetometer trace. So here you will see that the sports hall was not long enough for a three minute walking one direction, and we had one turn, which you can really clearly see in that data. If you walk faster, you have more turns uh, in a sports hall, and you have these three turns here. If you look at 90 degrees, you can see walking, changing direction, walking, changing direction. And you can see the changes in direction, because essentially that's a square figure of eight. And for 180 degrees, you can see them walking and changing direction much more quickly. What does this show in terms of the energetic cost of turning? Well, essentially, when it's a really slow walking pace, which is incredibly slow, of 2.5 kilometers per hour, there isn't a cost of turning. But as you increase that pace, it starts to cost you energy to change direction. This is particularly interesting because firstly, we haven't really accounted for that in how we're measuring how much people are expending. But secondly, it gives us an idea in terms of what kind of interventions, particularly for children, to do. Can we start to integrate more turns in there to increase the energy expenditure? So beyond that, it gets us thinking about how do we you know, visualize data? Because if we haven't looked at the visualizations there, we may not have known what was actually going on. One particular example uh, is compositional analyses. And I won't go into this in too much detail because um, I believe uh, Melissa McNary is also going to be talking about respiratory conditions um, and allude to some of this work as well. But essentially here we're thinking about 24 hours and what your movement profile looks like over that time. Now if you substitute part of that, it has to come somewhere else. So 
if you decrease your sentry time, where is that going to? Is that going to light selectivity, moderate, et cetera? And what it can start to tell us is, ideally, if you shift something in one direction, what's the likely outcome on the health profile? So in this case, it, it's lung function because we're looking at cystic fibrosis, but it also could be depression, for example, or various different outcomes. But it gives us a, almost a sweet spot, if you like, in terms of what ideally we want to target changes in. Okay, that's all, all you know, very good and well as researchers, but what about for people we're actually trying to target? Is that something they can really understand? I mean, for me, there's two major problems. One, children don't really understand how much they've done. They can have six second bouts of activity. Can you think about adding up all your six second bouts of activity across the day to see if you've met your 60 minutes? Probably not. But also, if we as researchers are arguing how much, how many cut points we use or what actually constitutes physical activity, how do we actually expect children to understand that? And the second is, children are really reluctant to relinquish technology. So doing interventions where you take it away from them effectively aren't going to work. So we need to think about ways of translating complex data simply. And we can do this through visualizing, through sensory outputs, or auditory. This work actually started with a computer scientist, Carissa, uh, who was originally at Swansea University. And she came to me with a project uh, that I still love doing called Mission Possible. Um, it was set, so again, co-design process, coming back to qualitative research, but it was set where we spoke to them. They wanted a secret agent theme. They wanted a free runner that was going into their school, setting up Monday morning missions. They then had to decide and do the missions. Their teams would wear their respective colored Fitbits. They would go out, do the missions, and come back into the classroom where their Fitbit would sync with the school's Wi-Fi system and update. If they were on, for example, the pink team, the length of that strip was how long they'd been active, and how fast it flashed was how intense it was. And the children absolutely loved this. Um, they enjoyed it, they found it was encouraging, but one thing they did come back with was saying that they wanted something they could see and keep. Okay. So that brought us on to a different idea. And there's an exogaming lab in Melbourne, and they had started converting heart rate into 3D printed models. But it was a case of, well, actually, what happens if we use accelerometry to do this? And at the time, we had a really creative uh, PhD student who was working on the turning study, and we gave him a very left field option of changing his, his field, of course, um, and picking up this 3D printing project. Um, and Sam was um, definitely, without doubt, one of the, the best students for this. He did maybe make us a little bit nervous when he came and said, I think we need to use Play-Doh for our research. Um, that gives sport and exercise sciences a great name, right? But with that, it was a case of how do, we, how do children understand it? How do we model it for them? Because they're far more creative than us. So this was the first step in the co-design process. Now, we piloted this with academics, and this is what they came up with. And now you can see why we went to the children. <laughs> so we have primary school children. This one um, is, is a star where they have seven arms, and the bigger the arms, the more active they were, representing each day of the week, right the way through to a face whereby you could have seven long strands of hair, and you're really active with a big smiley face. Or unfortunately, if you were bold and had no hair, you're very unhappy. Secondary school children, slightly less creative, they like bar charts. I mean, they had their hobbies in there, but they still just like bar charts. So we took this and converted them into models that we could use based on the accelerometry data, and then fed it back at the British Science Festival, which saw over 6,000 people coming through the doors. We gained feedback on the six shortlisted models, and then refined them. But the second point in this um, was very much a case of making sure that they understood the models. Because if the children couldn't relate to them, there was no point then doing the intervention. This meant, led to a couple of refinements. We integrated a target bar so they knew where they were relative to the government guidelines. But we also added in um, a blob, if you like, uh, to separate the vigorous and the moderate intensity. So they also knew the intensity that they were doing. And similarly for the secondary school, a target bar, but also the depth of the bar represented the intensity. So the next step, was then the intervention. And this was a three-month faded intervention. 
where children would wear accelerometers. They would then get the data that would feed back into a 3D printed model. Um, and then they would get this at four time points across those three months. This was for, sorry, for both primary and secondary school children and having an intervention and a control group. Now, just very briefly, because I'm conscious of time, but the key results were that they were enthusiastic about it. They really got excited. They thought it was really cool. So did I. Um, and they could relate to the model. They could pick up the model and understand why they had a bigger bit on a Monday compared to a Wednesday, for example. And even at this point, 25% of the children could use it as a motivational tool and wanted to then beat, beat what they'd done for the next time. By the time we got to the fourth model, 80% of the children started to use them as comparisons. They were overlaying the models and trying to show where they were active and what they'd managed to change and why things were different. 45% had then started to use it as a motivational tool with 15% of those also looking at specific goal setting strategies. So there are various different outcomes that we can look at. But one of the interesting things for me was this increased awareness so really them understanding where they were relative to where they needed to be in terms of the government guidelines. One of the issues with this, it's retrospective, so it's looking across the last week. Don't know about you, but I can barely remember yesterday. But it's also an overview. It just tells you what they've done on that particular day. So what we really need to be looking at is this real-time feedback. So giving them movement and data as they're going, but also still making sure that that's personalized for them. And who better to come to with the ideas for this than the children? So one of the Play-Doh models was actually uh, this with the treble clef and the music, with the idea that the higher the note, um, the more exercise they've done, and you could almost play your exercise back. What a brilliant idea. So that's something that we felt we followed up with. Now, apologies in advance for my cheesy take in films, but how many people have seen The Holiday? Thank God, there's a few people out there. For those who haven't, there's a moment where one of the the main, main characters is walking up to the stage to get an award. And with that, there's a personal theme tune. And I thought, wouldn't that be really cool to have your theme tune in terms of how much activity you've done? You've got a heartbeat. There you go. You've got your natural beat in there already. So you look at accelerometer data, and you can convert that into audio waves. But again, it's that co-design process in terms of how you interpret that. So this project's very much in the case of still being written up but it does give some ideas in terms of whether we can use different people being different instruments, whether as a person, the more active you are, the more instruments you release, and you can become your own band. You can create the music of some of the ideas that they've had and almost have to try and get your friends to replicate it. And again, you've got, if you've got a really lots of bars of rest or a low drone, you're not doing much activity at all. Or if it's really fast paced, you're maybe moving a lot faster. So it's a different way for children to really understand their movement. Where does this take us? Future directions. Well, one thing is we've mainly focused on quantity. But what we probably really need to look at is quality of movement as well. It's not just about the quantity. So this brings us back to animals again. If you have an accelerometer and you're measuring in three planes and you move in every single way possible, you get a sphere. And if you're moving faster, it's a bigger sphere because you're pulling away from gravity, hence the G-sphere. So a red rough lemur moves in every single way possible. An elephant seal, lots and lots and lots and lots of somersaults. And a water bell doesn't really do a great deal, does it? And that's probably fairly similar to a lot of our children's profiles, unfortunately. So let's think about this in terms of specific movements. This example on the left is showing a basketball free throw. So you've got the supporting arm with the blue, and then you've also got that follow through arm that you can then start to see in maps, but also look at the velocity profile of it. So another thing that looked at, so this data was actually showing a sea swimmer and looking at a dead reckoning technique, but actually swimming out and in. But if you, I started to think about this in a different way, so if we're looking at a stroke of a swimmer, for example, as you're putting your arm into the water, taking it out, it's costing you more energy. So you can see that moving away from the edge. When you get tired, you start to break down your movement quality and you start to see much greater variation. So that's really important and an interesting way for assessing what we call fundamental movement skills. So we had an MSE student who had an engineering background um, 
Alex for his sins has stayed on is now doing a PhD, but he had a very short amount of time with some data and came up with this concept of looking at almost what we call of um, a band, if you like, that if you're within that, you've got what's classed as a competent throw. And if you fall outside of it, you're not competent at throwing, as you can see here. But more importantly, you can also look at what point of the throw it's failing at and what we can do to maybe enhance that particular throw. Or we can look at it on almost a population level, if you like, and look at the mean throw that's successful in the green or where they tend to go wrong in terms of that red. So that's certainly some scope in terms of where we take this forward and lucky um, Alex has taken that a little bit further on in terms of PhD. So I've briefly spoken about the measurement, but also the interventions, but I do want to talk about monitoring. Um, what we really need to know to get accurate figures is looking at the long-term surveillance of physical activity. <coughs> One particular option is mapping GPS and accelerometry, so you know exactly where people are, you can look at the environment and see what kind of physical activity or sedentary behaviour, for example, that might promote. But realistically, where we're actually up to is just moving from self-report measures where we're saying what we think we've done, and we always overestimate, but actually have this measured using an accelerometer. Now, unfortunately, we were trying to set this up for across Wales when COVID-19 hit, but luckily for us, we managed to secure some funding from the Welsh Government to look at children's physical activity levels as well as mental health and well-being. Um, so we had four time points of data and the view is uh, for this to continue forward and thankfully we have a new PhD student who's hopefully going to drive this forward. We had uh, 1,700 children approximately to complete the, the self-report measures um, across the time points and a subsample of 800 children who wore the accelerometers and sending those monitors across the whole of Wales was much fun during COVID. But it did give us some interesting data. What we find is that not only did only 13% of the children actually meet the government guidelines during the first lockdown, but there was no significant difference between boys and girls. And usually what you see is a significantly higher amount of physical activity in boys. When they returned to school, you see that there was twice the increase of boys than girls. Sedentary time, we're looking at roughly 14 hours um, being sedentary during lockdown, with that decreasing by roughly an hour and a half when they return to school, and no sex differences there. I haven't got time to go into this into detail, but more novel metrics, such as intensity gradient, essentially this looks at your overall physical activity profile, and the more negative that is, then the more negative your profile. It's a very sensitive measure here, so there are actually a significant difference between boys and girls, and when we then delve into that more so, so this is your most active 30 minutes, 15 and 5 minutes, you then see that there are differences in there. <coughs> so essentially, there are no significant differences in time, but the boys in general are still more intense in time in terms of how they do the activity. And just one way of showing that uh, differently is looking at these profiles here. So what you want is a larger surface area, so the bigger the better. Here we've got upper primary school in blue, lower secondary school in green, and upper secondary school in red. And what you'll see is there's very different, uh, very little difference in upper secondary schools, but you get big differences upon the return to school um, in, the, in the younger year groups. Very similar for the girls as well, with very, um, to a smaller extent, but very little difference with the upper secondary school children. And that's a real concern and a key target area for going forwards. One of the real concerns was the low well-being areas from that uh, during lockdown, which substantially increased with uh, return to school, even with restrictions, and continued to increase again when the restrictions were removed. And there were significant differences be between boys uh, with much higher well-being scores, but also with each age, that well-being score decreased. So we tried to gain the voices of just short of 1,700 children uh, during this, asking one simple question, which was, how does lockdown make you feel? And you'll see that there's 75% of the responses that were negative, 12% for the positive, and 13% for mixed. And I just want to focus on one particular one, worry, anxiety, stress, and fear. It has made me a little uncertain. I find myself doubting myself a lot during lockdown or criticizing myself. When I get scared or anxious, I have these moments where I can't breathe or move. That developed over lockdown. I was always concerned about how I looked 
and I have expectations which I've yet to meet. This got worse over lockdown and I can't stop. I feel ugly and fat and worthless, even more so than when I was in school. And that's fairly hard hitting from an 11 year old. And then you look at something, nothing else makes them happy at all anymore and they feel they've lost their identity and are no longer thriving. So the question for me really is, yes, we can keep doing all this research, but it doesn't matter if you can't translate it and make an impact on those who you actually need to make an impact on. So with that, that's why we really push to set up the Welsh Institute of Physical Activity and Health, which is a pan-Wales network of all eight um, Welsh HEIs, as well as Sport Wales. Um, so a massive thank you to everyone who's been involved in really driving that forward, and a particular thank you to Owen Hathaway for really um, pushing this forward from a Sport Wales um, objective and providing funding, and delighted that we've just um, launched um, the, the third annual report. Okay. I've gone on long enough, so where do I start with co-authors? There are genuinely too many to thank, and I'm really sorry that I could only thank a few and um, name a few people through this, but there are key people to, in this that would not, you know, the research just wouldn't be made possible without them. That's postdoctoral researchers, PhD students, the ones that we got the blue cushy brown photos with, the ones who escaped it, and also on the right, the ones who still got to keep researching with me. <coughs> but most importantly as well, and beyond an academic setting, a massive thank you to family. Genuinely, this wouldn't have been um, possible without all the support across the years, so thank you very much. But it'd be remiss of me not to mention one key person. Um, that's my highest uh, co-author with over 100 publications together. But also, I would like to argue that probably um, you know, our key biggest success and our, our proudest um, moment would probably be our family and our daughter. So on that note, thank you very much for listening. Yes, we actually went back into um, the school. So we actually did quick, what we call two minute video interviews when we were giving them the models and got them to talk through them. And that's where we pulled out a lot of the information in terms of how they interpreted them. Um, we did also go back into the schools and then talk about them. Um, and they genuinely just loved it. They found it really exciting. Um, yeah, it was just, it was a fun project and they could genuinely reflect on it. For us, it's the sustainability of doing that going forward. Um, you know, how do you do that? We're, we're lucky that we're based in engineering and you can do things like batch printing. But even then, it's the process and the turnaround from collecting the accelerometers and that coming back. Um, so that there would have to be some kind of way to, to link that in. Um, but it was a, a good way to think about how they were understanding the physical activity level. So I don't see it as a long-term way to intervene and enhance, but I think it's a possible way to get them to understand. And until you get that, you can't really improve them. Yeah, yeah, I, th I yeah, think it's yeah. been applied in, in many ways. Um, it's ironically one of the ones that was the hardest to find funding for as well. the hardest implications is that long term and a lot of the times with funding bodies that you find that you can look and they want the outputs um, but not really the long term outcomes because it's a longitudinal measurement they'd have to wait a few years to really look at it 
um, in one of the, the projects, actually, I think the former PhD students actually in audience with um, Commander Joes, as we found that after three months um, for an intervention, you can see big spikes. But then, yes, they may continue to increase, but at a lesser extent into six months. And the key thing there is what do you need to change at that time point to either maintain the outcomes or to keep enhancing it? Um, but, it but the long term develops generally mean that they tend to slow off. Um, the interesting thing is that even if you can enhance it to some point, are you then slowing down that rate of regression because activity and, and health? If you had your journey again, what would you absolutely do the same and what would you um, I think it's one of those things, and I genuinely believe this, that you do learn from everything. Um, I think some, best, some of the best advice I've had from someone is, don't work with someone you couldn't go for a drink with. Um, <laughs> and I've held that one true. Um, but I think it's genuinely something that you, you learn a lot by having those kind of off, off the cusp, like it's at a conference, you know, maybe having those informal discussions that you actually gain a lot more from. And I think there's been some projects and you know th there have been some ho horrific ones along the way but I think you do learn from those um, I certainly wouldn't have changed how you know sometimes you think oh I could have saved a year and I could have gone straight into sport and exercise sciences or um, but I do think at some point you think I have no idea why I've just done this um, I am very much and I think Joe you, you're here <laughs> someone that says yes to a lot and is really not good at saying no and I think that's something that took me a long time to get to that point but I think all the things I said yes to and then panicked that I'd done it, I did actually gain from it. Um, probably avoided your question there. <laughs> um, it's just a, a lack of knowledge from my perspective at the time in terms of, you know, I was an undergraduate student, um, so I wasn't really aware of, of the process and what was deemed as novel, what the next process was. So I think it's very much a case of you know, if I was maybe further along, then of course you would try and push to look at that data and, and know that you had done it in a robust enough way that, that you could use the data and publish it. So it's just a lack of experience, I think, at that time point. And it's only later when you have a minute and actually reflect and you think actually there's still something fairly novel in that. a question for the older generation sat next to me really but have you considered doing something similar in older adults yeah, yeah I, I do, I actually, do actually, actually work across, across the population I'm just biased in my examples that are given um so um Andrea who's here we're actually doing a, a lot of work in older adults and as is Joe and some of the work we've done is actually looking at intergenerational so looking at grandparent grandchild dyads uh, Rachel who's here as well did her PhD in that area um, so very much a way of how you can engage different people in a different way. But yeah, a, a lot of the things, I, I, I dare not mention one of the projects at the moment, but we are doing work around um, an interactive bike, for example, that can give you feedback and you're almost cycling down memory lane. So it uses Google Maps to, to feed back to it. Um, so I think those kind of things are, are really exciting. So you can certainly use, you know, a lot of people say you can't use technology with older adults and no. There's a, there's a really, really neat way to them. <laughs> there we go, great. Just travel down to Swansea. <laughs> well, it was a, a real general question. This perhaps gives Mel a bit of time to think of maybe an answer to for her after her talk. But there's loads of PhD students here and master's students. What advice would you give to them based on your experience? Uh, for me, it's, and this is coming from, from the yes woman, it's grab ev every opportunity. Um, PhD will genuinely probably one of you know the hardest times and you know academia is, is a hard career at times it's grasping the opportunities but taking time to reflect as well um, and I think it's it's trying to accept that sometimes you don't get you know things are frustrating it takes you time to get things but when you finally nail it it is worth it um, and I think it's just accepting that you do there's a lot of rejections at times as well and it's really celebrate those wins um, you know, and try and learn from as many people as possible. And I said this to all, I think there's a lot of former PhD students here, but, you know, they're the experts in it, not me. You know, they're the ones who are really driving that one strand of research forward. So it's, you know, have confidence in yourself. I say that having been someone that had imposter syndrome for three years, thinking that Stuart would find out that I wasn't worthy of doing a PhD. Um, but yeah, do try and have confidence in yourself and confidence in your research. Last question. 
Thank you, uh, Kelly, for a great talk, and it's been great to see the journey from Acto. Um, two very quick questions. Given what you said about promotion and technology, um, from a researcher's point of view, where do you see the utility of wearables, like Fitbits and Apple Watches for adolescents in particular? Yeah, there's some work that we've done. that We came across barriers because of access, data access, um, be long, be, sorry, below that kind of 13-year-old um, time point. Some of the feasibility work we've done is very much that they want to engage with it, um, but it's got to be something that's interesting. So what you find with adolescents at the moment is that they will wear them initially, but until they gain the value or they understand the data that they feed back from, they then feel that they've got the benefit from them and no longer wear them. So it's, for me, um, personally, and I'm obviously biased with this, but I think there's a gamification approach here in the sense of making sure that you change things at different time points so you keep them engaged with it. Because otherwise, with anything, once you've understood what's there, there's nothing else to learn from it. Um, so it's trying to do that. But I also think there's um, an argumentation index um, way where y it almost argues with you. So it, the, the feedback knows how you respond to it. So if it's someone like me, you just tell me that someone else has done something more and that's motivated me to do it. But for others, you do that sense of comparison and that demotivates them. So it's almost using that kind of um, machine learning to feed back and give the right message at the right time to people, but as well as understanding the context they're in. So if, it's, if you're in a meeting, for example, or you're at school and it's saying, get up and do 20 star jumps, like, that's not gonna happen because, I mean, it'd be brilliant if it did, but it's not gonna happen. So I think it's it's that kind of AI message and integrate into it. Well, what was the job offer that you got before you came? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually yeah, yeah, doing, doing uh, workplace interventions. <laughs> we have to conclude. Um, we can continue the discussions outside, so kindly. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, sorry, it's a few minutes over. I don't know what was the problem with the first.